morning everyone welcome to the user experience design session in the teacher technician and advisor workshop series i'll be handing over very shortly to martin who is the course leader for graphics at nua and also jason who is soon to be a graduate of nua who studied on the ux design course firstly for those of you who haven't joined any of these sessions so far my name is liv and i work in the recruitment and outreach team at nua we're very aware that during this uncertain time, many of your students will be feeling anxious about their futures and we want to support you and them the best way that we can. To keep you up to date with how the NUA community is approaching the COVID-19 situation, we'll post a link in the chat to our FAQs. Just some housekeeping bits before we do get going. We'll be keeping your audio and video off for the first part of this session this morning while Martin delivers a presentation and introduction to you all about UX design at NUA. There is then an interactive session where we'll be looking for two volunteers. So if you're feeling brave this morning, we'd love for you to put yourself forward to carry out a series of tasks for us. And if you're willing to do that, you can just put a message in the chat function. And at that moment, we'll facilitate you kind of coming online, sharing your video and your thoughts with us as well. We are also recording this session this morning, so please don't worry if you have any technical problems, we will make sure to send this out to you afterwards so you won't miss anything. If you do have any questions throughout the session, you can just pop those into the chat for us and I'll be on hand to answer those and we can also put those to Martin and to Jason as we move through the session this morning. So I think that's everything from me, so I'll hand over to Martin now to get going with the introduction. Thank you very much, Liv, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, lovely to uh, see you, as it were. Um, my thanks to Liv and also to Sam, who are helping uh, make sure this all runs smoothly, and to Jason, who is, as Liv said, a soon-to-be graduate um, of the course, uh, and he, you will um, see him in a little while as he takes you through a really fun little exercise. Um, so as Liv said, I'm the course leader. Um, I'm the course leader actually for four courses, three of them with, the, with, with a very strong focus around graphics and graphic design and also this course, the user experience uh, design course, which um, in its uh, joining with the three graphics courses is very, very new to us. Um, Jason is graduating from the existing course, which is also quite new, but we've relocated UX within the graphics sort of camp as it were. And in a moment or two, I'm going to tell you why we've done that. Um, but so far, it's working very, very well. And I'm really excited to talk to you about what we do on this course. It is a huge sort of growth area for employment. Um, so for anyone with, um, with students thinking about uh, a creative career, but perhaps they're a little more analytical, maybe a little more mathematical, um, UX is a real possibility for them. So I'm going to take you through uh, roughly what we do on the course um, fairly quickly, should only be 10 or 15 minutes at the most. Um, right, so uh, as I said, that's me and these are the four courses that I lead and you'll see the fourth of those there is user experience design. Um, fundamentally, what we do is we um, teach you how to um, think about the digital products and services that we are all used to using, things like apps and websites in particular. And uh, we help you to analyze them, create them, think about them, research them, um, observe people using them, which is one of the things we'll be doing this morning. And the purpose of all that is to make them better. We live in a, in a world where we, we spend an enormous amount of time online um, using products and services. And so UX is a discipline that has been born out of the need to make those experiences better. If there were a sort of underlying philosophy, I think, to what user experience designers do, it is this. Frank Tremero is an American designer um, and a regular commentator on design generally, and particularly UX. And this really sums up uh, really what user experience designers are very good at doing. They think about people. They think about how people use a thing um, and what people's needs are. So as I said earlier, user experience is a, is a discipline that, that really suits people that are interested in observing human behavior, they're interested in the psychology of the way we, we live our lives and the decisions that we make. 
Um, so as well as being creative, there's that slightly sort of interesting scientific element to what we do, which is why, or one of the reasons why, this is a BSc course, and it's worth pointing that out. It's not a BA course, it's a BSc course. I'm going to give you a fun little example of, of how this quote kind of comes to life. Um, here we see um, a sort of gr grassy area, in a, probably in an urban town or um, sort of city. Um, the path there on the, uh, on the left of the screen is, is the bit that was designed, a town planner or somebody like that thought what we need is a path um, and the path should uh, you know, go off to the left there. But the actual sort of gen genuine day-to-day -day experience of people is that they don't want to walk along the path because it's quicker to walk across the grass. So this is a sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek example, but um, it is an example of where people people's needs are not being met and user experience is about meeting people's needs. At NUA we very much believe it's a creative discipline, it is about solving problems and that idea of creativity and problem solving is one of the reasons that we put it with the graphics courses. Graphics is all about thinking about problems and how to solve those problems. Um, it also requires research thinking, ideas and design, as do the graphics courses. So it, it, it lives very, very comfortably alongside those other three courses. I'm going to show you a fun little piece of um, interface design, really. Uh, so, so this is a little introduction to um, a proposed uh, app. It's a little bit like Spotify, but instead of being for music, it's for, um, it's for comedy. Um, this is a little bit of motion, so hopefully it'll play well. Um, forgive me if there's a slight lag. Um, as we're sort of broadcasting this over the Wi-Fi. So that little um, little film there demonstrates a, a user journey through that app um, and you saw lots of sort of um, digital interactions that were created by the designer. So that's a sort of small example of some of the things that you might do on, on the course. Um, as I said earlier, um, UX requires visual design skills, that little example you've just seen. Um, it looks like something, it's got typography in it, it's got layout. Um, that color consideration, those sorts of things very much belong in, um, in the sort of graphics world and they belong very much in the UX world. Um, there are, there's consideration of how you use the app, um, ways in which you interact with it, how things move. Um, and as I said at the beginning, UX also requires that you think a little bit like um, not only a researcher, but someone that's interested in the sort of psychology of the way we use things. Um, we use um, a method that is not unique to UX, it's something that a lot of corporations use when they're trying to solve problems called the double diamond research method. Uh, the image here is some first year students getting to grips with the double diamond research method, which um, looks a little bit like this. Um, on the left, you are starting with a, a sort of set of questions around a problem and what we're really trying to do is work out um, what it is that we should be designing um, and what you do is you diverge your thinking as much as you can in the earliest stages of research you open things out and then you converge them as you get towards clarifying what the problem really is and we're not into design yet we're just trying to interrogate the problem and lay it bare and once you really understand what it is that you should be designing, you then again diverge that sort of ideation process, creating as many, many thoughts as possible um, before you then converge on the right answer. And this is a, this is a really classic um, way of working. As I said, it's not unique to UX, but it is something that we really, really encourage people to, to do. So there's a great deal of thinking and research that takes place um, in, in the process of designing better user experiences. 
here you see um, again first year work very very basic this is a sort of user journey through a proposed app and what's so sort of um, uh, easy I suppose about getting people started in something in UX is it although there's a great although it's all about sort of digital products and interfaces and there's lots of sort of software and possibly coding skills that go on a lot of the work initially can be done with things like post-it post-it notes and marker pens and pieces of paper and this little um, template on the image on the right of a sort of screen allows you to pull a piece of paper through it as if you are speculating as to how screens might change as you play with an app and designing things literally with a pen and paper is one of the ways that we get ideas moving and again that, that really mirrors how we work in graphics as well so these are little sort of as i said user flow user experience user journeys as as someone navigates a proposed um, website which in this case is being shown on a, a smartphone screen so this is again more work from a first year workshop A uh, deceptively simple little idea there. Um, really, it was a, 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 an app aimed at students, um, encouraging them to cook something nutritious whilst they live in halls. But again, it, it, lots of subtle little thoughts there. The way that the screen um, did certain things to indicate, for example, the next stage in the cooking process or how much time a particular stage of the cooking process would take. Lots of clever little thoughts in there. Um, one of the things that um, we do is we start to def define what the problem is and how, the, how, how a particular thing should work is we do what's called wireframing, which is where you start to essentially sketch out um, in sort of line form only the elements uh, and the sort of composition of a screen. And these are the sort of things that you, you end up covering as you go through the course. So obviously things like web and app design and prototyping those um, products visual design and typography and the design of symbols and icons, all of those things very much linked to graphics generally. Information architecture is about the structure and the order of information, how, um, how a user should see things and the order in which they should see them. Um, we work with motion and animation, obviously. We do some basic coding in HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Um, we play with things like aug augmented reality and virtual reality. And we teach you all the research methodologies that user experience uh, designers need and we create and help you create and learn how to create things like user personas. This is a lovely little um, in a digital uh, interactive piece um, which uh, played with um, the very precise nature of German words and their literal um, English translations. Um, and it was a little thing that you could play with and it was quite funny. Lots of different sub menus within this, um, within this product. This is a, a little proposal for a, a savings product, just like, like a banking, um, uh, like, a, like a savings product for a bank. I think it's for national savings and investments. <laughs> It's important to, to mention that what you're seeing there is it feels very much like a sort of finished solution, but prior to getting anywhere near that, there is a great deal of research um, and thinking around what a product should be, what it should look like, what it should feel like, um, and how it should function. Uh, and then we do things like user testing, which is gonna be the focus of the workshop we're gonna do with you this morning, where we 
we actually observe someone using the proposals and we make a set of modifications and amendments based on the findings of that user testing. So the thing about user experience is that there is this sort of iterative process um, where you are generating in theory improvements to the design based on testing that design so that by the time you get to the finished product you have something that works and is needed um, there are again some little images of, of things that feel very finished these are um, screens for um, an app called hostel world um, which is aimed very much at the, at the travelers um, market so these are pieces of work from third year students. My name's Pete Abbott and my work for my final major project revolves around the use of augmented reality as an interface for smart connected domestic products. What the project aims to do is to give us better insights into the smart connected objects that we find around us. We're also looked into developing a source map and what this does is it helps show how you might draw data from the internet to give you nutritional information, recipes and also process the information. So in this microphone, my final media project is called SnapWeb. It's a physical site building kit. It's all done with magnets. So what you have is physical components that are printed on plywood. And the idea is that you can actually put all these and actually build it physically and see that you can scan into the website and see the website being generated. Definitely encourage to assume what interests us in a rapid context. Tutors are very supportive when it comes to the They're always very keen to help us learn how this has a world application. Two lovely, lovely, lovely projects there. The first using um, uh, smart technology embedded in everyday products, uh, allowing you to um, use AR. Um, you, there was a lovely example of a saucepan, um, and when you put your um, AR enabled device over it, uh, it brought up um, uh, information that was sourcing from the, from the World Wide Web. So for example, nutritional information or cooking information. And the second product, uh, the project there was a sort of um, physical website building tool where you could place these tiles in, the, in an order and it would create in real time um, a, a website for you. So it's a really fast growing sector. Um, when I talk more broadly about the four courses um, I, and I talk about UX in particular, I talk about the fact that it's, it's it, it, at the moment on the face of it, it feels like the um, the, the most confined of the disciplines but it is growing um, very very quickly and I think the truth of the matter is to say that the students that join us in September will be producing work in the third year that we can't even fully imagine at the moment. Um, nonetheless employers are telling us there's a huge demand for um, UX designers and we, we have a very good track record of placing people into those jobs even from the uh, existing graphics courses um, Jason, who's joined us today, already has secured full-time employment as well. Um, and the fact of the matter is that, that starting salaries in, in UX are commanding, um, are, are higher, sorry, so graduates are commanding higher salaries than their co-equivalent uh, junior graphic designers. So it's, it's a very, very much um, in-demand uh, skill. And a recent report in one of the leading design journals said that agencies that were increasing their staffing uh, were actually looking for people with UX skills rather than more broadly graphic skills. So um, that takes us to, to, to the end of the talk. Um, I'm now going to uh, essentially uh, stay in the wings but hand over to Jason who's going to run us through um, a little uh, fun exercise um, which will it, which is one part, it's really important to note, uh, to, to note that this is one part of a much broader um, exercise that we do within, within the total scope of UX design. Um, were we to be doing this on campus, we'd be using our UX lab, um, which is a, a facility where someone can use a digital product and that, that interaction is recorded and relayed to a separate room where observers can watch that person using that um, using that product, but I'll hand over to Jason who'll, who'll tell us a little more. 
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jason Brown. I've just finished studying the BSc UX design course at NUA and will be starting my graduate position at National Grid in September, <coughs> working on UX for <coughs> systems and goodness knows what else. Um, so what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be doing an interactive task, as Martin has said. We're going to be doing a very basic usability um, task on six websites. And the idea of this is just to show you a little bit about one of the many things that we do on the UX course. Usability testing is a big part of the course. Um, after students have kind of envisaged, researched and designed their software, the usability testing is really the kind of make or break part of that journey. It's where we discover if we've done things right or wrong, or maybe sometimes a little bit in between. Um, so it's really important that students do understand how to conduct a good usability test that's fair and accurate and doesn't have any biases. So we're going to be doing some today. It'll be a fun little exercise and um, yeah, it should, be, uh, it should be a good insight as to what we do on the course. Thanks, Jason. So um, we're just looking for two volunteers. So maybe if we can get one person who could let us know um, in the chat if they're happy to come on and share their video and audio with us. And then they'll be just doing a little task via my computer. So I'll be giving you remote control of my computer very briefly. And um, so I can see we've actually got David. If David is there, I believe David has actually done this um, in the UX lab on campus. So it might be interesting if he's willing to, to come on and have a go via Zoom. But if anyone is willing, oh, so <coughs> David, would you be willing to share your audio with us and come on screen? I've just requested it, there he is. Hi David, how are you? Good morning everyone, I'm good, thank you. Um, so if you're happy to, I've kind of, Put you forward here, <laughs> but I'll... fair enough. It's it's fine. Yes, yes, I've 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 been in and seen seen it, so I'm more than happy. <laughs> so what I'll do, David, is I'll give you remote control of my screen, and um, so you should get a little notification. Um, yeah, and I can see you're moving it. So Jason will now kind of talk you through the task, and um, and we'll be asking you to kind of narrate what you're doing and talk through your decision making process. So I'll I'll let Jason. Kind of take this forward with you. Okay, okay. So, so David, uh, good to see you again by the way. Um, David, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be browsing for a, a sim for you on three different um, mobile network providers. We've got Vodafone, <coughs> which we have here, and uh, EE and O2. So these are the three sites that we're going to test and compare. So really all I want you to do is on the Vodafone website, just find a SIM card, so no phone, SIM only, that would fit your personal um, requirements. It's probably just worth pointing out, um, and you know, this is for the benefit of everybody watching and listening in, that we're not, um, we're not testing David here. What David's doing is, is really testing the websites, um, yes. and that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way that we all respond to digital products is the way we respond to them. We, 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 we naturally, you know, see things in certain ways and, and we, we are prompted to, to interact because of what we're seeing. So th this isn't really a test of um, anyone who puts a hand up and volunteers. It's, it's that person's um, test, if you like, of the product, not that. So this, as I said, this isn't about us testing you. And in other words, there, you can't actually get this wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about how the, how the sites function. Is, is that fair, Jason? Yeah, definitely. That's why we call it usability testing as opposed to user testing. Yeah. Because um, we're testing the usability of the product, not the actual user. Yeah. Right. So I've got to try and find myself a SIM, not a phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see right here, I can see that, that it says shop. So I've moved my mouse pointer over there mm -hmm. um, and I've had a pop up come up. Um, was that was it a type of SIM? Was it was it a pay monthly or a pay as you go or anything or? Um, whichever would suit you best. So I'll let you decide which payment method. All right. Well, I can see they've actually got a SIM only bit. Oh, uh, right. I have to come down the way because if I go across the way, it suddenly goes to Y Vodafone. So if I if I come down, I can see SIM only. So oh, it's highlighting. So I'll click on that and see what comes up. 
So did you find that, I mean, we, we call this a mega menu, by the way, because it's got a lot of items categorized into one menu. I know Liv likes that term. <laughs> um, so how did you find using that mega menu? Did you find it intuitive? Did you find it difficult? Did you find it easy? What were your thoughts on it? Well, I think because what I was looking for was to the left hand side, I saw it quite quickly. But if it was, if what I was wanting was over the, over the other side of the screen, it'd be, a, it'd be a lot of stuff to read through. So it just so happened that what I was looking for was quite quick. But yeah, I think what I didn't like was that the moment that it was I had to go down and then across, I couldn't go diagonal because suddenly it then picked up the other, the other bit. Um, right, so I can see they've got a special offer thing, mm -hmm. um, but not quite obvious where everything else is. So I need to probably scroll down. Um, Right, so they've given me pay monthly and pay as you go, and I've got sort of red and black options, so phone sim, data sim, well, I'm presuming it's from my phone, so I'm going to try to click on that, on the, pay, on the phone sim, see what comes up. They're definitely pushing me to pick the special offer thing because it keeps coming up every single time and it fills the screen. So it's not convincing you to kind of look into that special offer then? No, you're not interested in it or do you just not know enough about it to really warrant it? I don't know enough about it and it's kind of getting in the way of me. Like I wouldn't mind if it was a, if, if it was a small banner mm -hmm. and I could see immediately down, but now I've got all this, this massive banner that fills, that fills my screen. Um, so I'll scroll down and then I'll see, all oh, right, so here's got other things. Um, yeah, they, they, they definitely keep pushing lots of special offers at me. Um, but I can now see some options and I've got um, some little icons, which are probably tell, tell, trying to tell me what this contract's best for, um, yeah. which... Um, but it, it, the, the, the names don't necessarily tell me a lot. So unlimited max. Well, how is unlimited max different from being unlimited? But <laughs> Maximum unlimited. Yeah, that sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> and then unlimited light. Well, if it's light, it's hardly unlimited. But, it, <laughs> it, but that, that may be the marketing people rather than the website itself. But I can see that, well, I'm wanting a full, I'm wanting a, a, I want one that, can, that I can do sort of maybe a little bit of data, a little bit of social media is a phone. So it looks like this might be the plan that I want here. So mm -hmm. I can see that fairly quickly. Um, and I can see it, it, I can see quite quickly the cost. Um, so I can maybe click on choose the plan. And then I have to say I'm a new customer and then sign up. But yeah, so I can get there. I can get that far to maybe selecting it and signing up to it. Um, so I think that the icons were quite useful on one level, um, but now it won't let me unclick. So it seems that I've you... mind and I don't know how to go back. <laughs> okay, so there's a flaw right there. So there's a, yeah, uh, so I can cli place. I'm clicking, but it's not taking me back. So and maybe if I go back, oh no, it takes me all the way back. So. I've decided, I've changed my mind, but I couldn't click out from that option. And then it's giving me the banner again. Okay, so so you found, okay, so you did find a sim that you felt worked for you. Um, you were just talking about these icons here on the site. So uh, do you think they're easy to understand or do you think they could potentially be misinterpreted or? Well, I mean, I can understand that's like says good, for, I'm presuming that's like meant to be good for me using my phone. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming that's meant to be messaging, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not quite getting what that icon means. Uh, yeah. I don't know what that one means. Um, I get that means gaming, I'm presuming. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quite too sure why I'd want to have Ultra HD on a smartphone. Good question. Yeah. So, okay, so how did you find the the shopping experience on this site on the whole then? Um, I think that for me, it's the banners that get in the way of, I, I want to be able to get to, I, I like to compare my options. I don't like being given 
this is the, the this is what you should you should buy i like being able to look and and, and compare what i'm doing mm-hmm. and i can't see a quick way of comparing plans other than me having to manually look at them and compare them side by side so there's not so on, on, on other on, on other things you might have select three plans and then compare them side by side i can't see how i could do that there's five plans but i don't see how i can directly compare them side by side without keeping all those ideas in my head myself and how do you feel about the color scheme used does it make you feel calm does it make you feel more alert and kind of wanting to do things faster did it encourage you to spend money how do you feel about that well, all the red kind of makes me feel like I've got to make a decision. It's red. I have to make a choice. I have to, it, it's kind of, it's, it, it, it's urgent. I have to, and, and, and then it's just like, oh, uh, and, and then, I mean, the green's quite nice because it's like, oh, I've made a decision. But the red <laughs> does make me feel a bit like, oh, maybe I should switch my plan because it's red. Therefore, I've made a mistake. Mm-hmm. Okay. So on the whole, not an overly positive experience then. Um, it might just be the fact that it's just the colors, it's, it's their corporate colors, but I don't like, yeah, I, mm, some good things, but mm, some things, I, I, definitely the, it's the, the thing for me is this big, massive special offer banner, which means I have to scroll down every single time I want to get anywhere. That's irritating. So they're, they're clearly really pushing that then, aren't they? They're really, really aggressive in the red. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, I think if you weren't making me do this, I'd go, oh. I can't be bothered. I'll go. To, I'll go somewhere else. Mm. Which is Should what we do gonna... that then? Should we move on to the next one? So, David, if you click the EE tab, this is your next task. Okay, so you just need to do the same again, really. <laughs> right. So again, I can see a shop up here, mm-hmm. and I get another big menu. Uh, this is bigger than the last one. Um, it's not, I don't think it's as easy to navigate as the last one. I think the other one was quite nice because it had clear columns. Whereas here, I'm not quite too sure what the columns are all about. Um, and I can't see, I can see phones. I can see plans and packs. Because it, obviously, they want me to buy something from Samsung. Um, so, mm. oh, there it is, SIM only down there. Um, but I had to do a bit of hunting to try and find it. Okay, so it's not immediately obvious, which, by the way, is actually quite a common problem with the mega menu. Um, that's something that I have found on websites that I've made and also websites that I've looked elsewhere, so I don't really like them that much anymore. Right, and this makes more sense to me, because last time I said phone sims and data sims, I couldn't work out what they meant by a data sim, whereas now I'm presuming by a data sim they meant for a tablet or for some form of Wi-Fi box, mm-hmm. mobile broadband box. So I can now see, ah, so I, I didn't have to scroll quite so much. I could see naturally that there was a natural scroll I had to do, whereas in the Vodafone one, I wasn't too sure where I was scrolling to, whereas when this came up, I could see sim only deals, and I could see, oh, I need to scroll down a little bit, which is still a little bit irritating because I'm on a desktop and not on iPhone. Um, I expect to maybe scroll if you're on a, on a smart device, but I don't always, I don't expect to have to scroll down all the time if I'm using um, a desktop. Because I've got I've got the real estate I've got the space to see it but I can't but okay so pay monthly um, colors are a bit calmer it's a bit more sedate I don't feel so agitated this time um, so is it, so it makes you feel a bit more relaxed and do you kind of feel like you can browse a little bit more than you could oh I hate these red? I hate these let's chat they're they're irritating and get me in the way if I want to chat to you I'll ask for it. Um, so I've now got to close that down, which is an irritation. Um, right, they're definitely pushing the data bit. I get that massively, and I can see, oh, well, I'm presuming they're all, it looks like they're all unlimited minutes and texts. And they've got, I've got a few plans. I can see some plans are half shaded out. So obviously they've got, oh, they've got a lot of plans. So I'll click on that, on the plus to see the 12 plans. Um, they're giving me a lot more plans. They haven't got any of those little icons, which is probably it doesn't really matter. Um, but I've got lots and lots of options now, and I'm a little bit confused as to what the difference is between all the options. And I can see the price differences quite clearly. So um, do you like how they highlight 
two of these plans as recommended? Or maybe um, I think one's recommended and one's unlimited that they've highlighted. Yeah, I've I don't know why they're recommending it to me because they don't know me. It's just like recommended. Why is it? Why is it recommended? Are they? Um, I I don't. If if this if 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 I was an existing customer, I might get that, but I don't understand why they're recommending it to me when I've just I'm a random person that's just clicked on the website. Mm-hmm. So it, it feels a little bit like a bit of a hard sell, and I don't like these counters like you have to buy it in the next day or you won't get the special offer. Those sorts of things make me think I don't want to buy it because you're clearly offloading something onto me that you're that you know is not worthwhile, and if you're you're incentivizing me by making me feel um the need to buy it and And what i'd like as again as i said in the previous one i like to be able to compare things side by side and i can see no way of selecting plans to compare their features i'm going to have to do it manually possibly with a pen and paper writing down well what's the difference between this 20 pound a month and this 20 pound a month and what's the difference between them and um these are £25 a month, so what's the difference? And I can't see, much, I can't really, if I maybe, oh, I can see the difference now. It's the time, the length of time of the plan. But that's kind of, they're kind of burying that almost so I don't realise it's there, that it's, kind of, it's, it's there, but it, I'm having to look for it. Mm-hmm. So just kind of talking about this from a uh, UX perspective to the, to the group here. Um, these are the sort of considerations that we have to take into account when designing any sort of website. So it's not always necessarily about how in this case David um, deals with finding the certain content or actually using the website. A lot of the UX course is actually about how do people feel. Do they feel uh, happy? Do they feel sad? Do they feel pressured? All of these things which can of course change the, uh, the experience of the website for the individual so that's another big consideration of the oh, course i can't reach it right now and this is where the um uh, the first year of graphics will really help students going forward with this course because on that in that first year they'll learn about a lot of these theorems color theory font typography things like that that can uh, really make or break a website's experience as we have seen here already okay so David, how do you feel overall about the EE website then? Well, the colours make me feel calmer. Um, I'm not, they've got, they give me a lot of information, so I'm a little bit confused, okay. is what I'd say I feel. I, I don't feel as anxious as I did with the Vodafone one, but I feel kind of confused because mm-hmm. I'm not too sure why there's all these different plans and what the difference is other than and, and and it's not always immediately obvious why there's a difference um so vodafone were trying to pushing me down you must pick this one package here i've got more choice but i don't understand why i've got more choice so i'm, I'm I, I think confused is probably the best way of describing my experience here okay interesting so uh should we try the o2 website then Okay. Uh, okay, right. So, O2. Okay. Right, so, so go, go up to the top. I can see again there's a little shop button. Mm-hmm. Um, and I get the menu come up. Um, a bit confused as to why the titles are, the, are in grey and fade because it, 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 it makes it harder for me. I don't quite like that because I, I don't like the fact the titles are fading <coughs> away and the it, it mm, let me see can i see oh i can see sims and tariffs i mean i can't what click. what do you normally associate like grayed out text with um sort of terms and conditions or things that aren't that important things that i'm not wanting to focus on mm-hmm. um whereas by agreeing it out it's just like well actually this isn't important and also i can't get why and and in the other menus these bits were clickable mm-hmm. Whereas here they're not, and I would expect in the menu everything to be clickable. So I don't know why that's not clickable. But I can see if I do scroll down. Yeah, I can see that I that when I hover over, I do get a change, but the colours are more. That change is more subtle. 
Whereas in the other two, it was more obvious. When I hovered over, I was definitely hovering over. Whereas they've gone for a bit more subtle here. So click on pay monthly sims. So do you prefer the subtlety or not so much? I think that menu was easier to navigate than the EE one because there was, there was less on it and the mm -hmm. column seemed to make more sense. But the color change is very, very subtle. Um, and I can imagine if I had poor color discrimination um, in my eye, if I, if I was had poor color discrimination, I might struggle to see the difference between that kind of grayish color and that kind of bluish color because it could look very similar. Um, but right. And of course, okay. that's the other uh, thing we have to take into account as well. Um, with UX design or, well, basically any sort of graphic design, I presume, it, you can please most of the people most of the time, but you will never be able to please everybody all at once. So sometimes there is that bit of compromise that you have to make. For example, in year three, I did all of my work for visually impaired and blind people. And I, know, I just know that that, that gray on the white text would just not work for them. They wouldn't be able to see it, or if they could, it'd be very, very poor. So you can target what you're designing at specific audiences, but if you're doing something that's kind of big tent like this, where it has to apply to a lot of people, then sometimes you will have to make compromises. It's quite a good example here, I think, Jason, also of, of one of the things I mentioned in the talk, uh, which was information architecture. And, and this O2 site dealing with the, um, you know, once David's clicked into um, SIM only deals, that this site d deals with its information in a very different way to the other two. The other two were making an attempt to just pop the offers up on a screen, whereas this site is is really kind of giving you a bunch of filters to play with before you get to any deals by the looks of it. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, that's that's a decision the brand has made to do it that way. Um, we're not sort of necessarily working out today whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing, but it is it is a difference. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different yeah. way of filtering and finding what you want rather than just presenting all the options. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you want me to carry on? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was actually about to comment on that because I can now suddenly start seeing that I can think about the contract length that I want. I can look at the data allowance that I want. How much data do I actually think I'm going to use? Um, and, oh, I can sort by my monthly cost, which I couldn't do that on the other one, not easily. Whereas now I can prioritize the cost. And I quite like that. I quite like being able to... I've got a bit more control, I think. This I, I feel a bit more in control. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see the price difference here on the, the right hand side and it feels more natural to read down the way for me anyway to see the differences as I can see the columns it's almost like there's almost like a table with columns where I can see the difference I can see the amount of data I'm getting I can see that actually there's no difference in terms of minutes and texts um, I'm not that fussed about Disney to be fair um, but I can see some things there so I can begin to see, oh, well, actually, I'm not wanting to spend that much. How much mobile data do I think I'm going to use? So I'd, I, I would feel, at this point, I feel more confident by making a choice. Whereas on EE, I, I would struggle to make a choice, whereas here I feel I could make a choice and choose a plan. So I guess in a way, this has been a kind of more successful shopping experience for you because you're, from what you're saying, I guess you're more likely to buy from O2 than you are from the others that we've tried this morning. Possibly. I mean, it's, I mean, uh, I mean, once I got past the menu bit, yes, I, I feel, I mean, it's the colours as well. The blues are much calmer, is a nice sort of calm colour and um, I'm not feeling that there's lots of, I don't feel that I'm being pushed into any particular plan. I don't feel pressurized i feel like oh i've got my time to think about this and maybe i could scroll down maybe i could think about well is there a difference if i change the con the contract length actually there is so actually oh maybe that maybe i maybe i was wrong to think about that i don't mind being in an 18 month contract and i can see that i, I can remember oh the price went down mm -hmm. so it so, does feel the, 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 i like the filters really i think it's the filters that i like because i can control what they're showing me 
and that's something that you missed from the other two websites where they didn't appear to have any easy way to filter well not, not from what you could see anyway no i mean it felt like it felt like they were controlling me they were controlling they were trying to control me while i was getting to control the website mm -hmm. which is quite a a common e-commerce tactic but which in in this case has backfired quite dramatically i would say <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it, if it would be a different experience if I was on a tablet or a smartphone uh, mm -hmm. to being on a desktop. But on the desktop, I like to be able to, because if I've got a big screen, I want to be able to get as much information on that screen as possible. Yeah. And it feels like O2 are letting me do that, whereas the other two were, were trying to control my experience, even on, a, on a, the, the, the real estate you get from a desktop. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good thought as well. And that's something else we have to consider. Um, in this day and age, really, the website should be uh, responsive. It should work on a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, and a phone. Um, and students, when they're testing their work, they tend to choose one or two devices to test it on. In the past, I've done kind of desktop and phone in the same session. Um, but that's another consideration that you have to take into account when doing usability testing. So David, thank you for doing those uh, tests for us. That's very, uh, very good of you and some interesting insights, I believe. Um, Liv, should we, could we quickly ask the others what they thought? Yeah, of do, you have, do you and Martin have anything you'd like to add um, kind of on top of what we've already discussed about what you felt about the different websites just before we move on? So my, my personal feeling is that um, Generally, I am quite a fan of this new dark mode trend that's going on, but I don't think it works too well on e-commerce websites. Um, so if we go back to the Vodafone site, we could see that we've got kind of, it is mostly sort of a very dark gray version on black background with lots of red, which uh, we mentioned kind of, I know that they're potentially corporate colors, but they could have done a red and white scheme instead, which I think could have been better. But um, this kind of red and black gives a sense of urgency and aggression and even danger to some extent, which may speed up the shopping experience um, for some people who feel a bit pressured perhaps, but it could put others off. Um, in terms of navigation, this site I think is, I think in terms of navigation they're all very similar, they're all using the mega menu which um, has its positives and negatives like all things. Um, but um, I don't particularly like the mega menus because sometimes I, f I'm, I feel like I'm staring at a load of links for ages and ages before I can find anything. I think it was the EE site where um, David was looking through the mega menu and I, I didn't see that SIM only bit. He, he's, he said it and as soon as he said it, I saw it. But I think if I'd have been there on my own doing it, I think I would have been staring at a menu for about five minutes, <laughs> um, not doing an awful lot. So when we have tested this site in the past, we've actually found a little help me choose thing on the left hand side to be okay and a, a fairly decent way of trying to find a sim. It kind of walks you uh, through a little wizard, which I guess is uh, Vodafone's way of doing the filtering, but David didn't see that. And um, also he dismissed the pop up that said, let's chat or whatever it was, which I believe actually takes you through this. So I think, I quite like the help me choose wizard, but I wouldn't necessarily notice it straight away. I think I would prefer the filtering like we saw on the O2 site. Um, EE, I feel was a perhaps slightly calmer experience. Um, the colors are totally different. They are kind of more positive, like we've got the yellows and the nice kind of uh, turquoisey colors. I believe they're kind of going towards perhaps a different target audience than Vodafone, or maybe Vodafone are trying to appeal to the younger generation by having these kind of darker colors. And they know that dark mode is the new trend, whereas EE is trying to keep things maybe more bright and positive and natural, that sort of thing. I agree with David that, this, that there's a lot of plans just kind of thrown at you and you have to read through them all. And although they just show several, um, key bits of information about each one, they still managed to take up a lot of space somehow. Um, so yeah, not the best. And then O2, I quite like the filtering as well. And it was quite good that you didn't have to go through some sort of wizard in order to get that. You could just literally filter by a few common um, factors. But 
on the whole, these sorts of mobile phones and websites are always there to trip you up <laughs> most of the time. Um, they try to push plans that are expensive and generally um, uh, unnecessary for a lot of people. So for example, I believe it was the Vodafone site where David pointed out that you could stream 4K content on your phone with this plan. And he said, well, why would I want 4K video on my phone? It's, it's too high a resolution for most people. But they'll see it as a selling point and then try to push that onto you. So the other thing with UX as well is I remember in year one having to write a paper about this. You do have to think about it from a business perspective as well. UX and business tie in they, they tie in together, especially with e-commerce, because if you can sell something expensive to the user, then not only have you made it easy for them to buy it, but you have also achieved a business objective, which is to make a sale. So I think on the whole, my favorite of these three sites would probably have been the O2 one, I think. What about you, Martin? The, the, the observation I, I draw is that it's really impossible to 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 take apart the branding from the functionality they are so bolted in together you know mm -hmm. we, we talk often in graphics about the look and feel of a thing and experience has got so much to do with how you feel about something and um once you start to look and play with any sort of product like like these websites um you're you're tripping over functionality issues and you're tripping over visual issues as well. So we're talking as much often about the color as we are about whether a, a, a menu is easy to find. So the two are completely welded. And I think from um, NUA's point of view, that's why, that's why we put UX alongside graphics. Um, in our studios, the students sit together. So there's a great deal of cross fertilization of knowledge and experience. Um, so the UX students working alongside graphics students and it really, really benefits um, uh, their knowledge um, and, it, you know, makes them better UX designers. And it makes the graphic designers better as well, you know, having, having UX people with them. So that's a really important thing to say. Yes, because the UX people are generally able to point out potential functionality or usability flaws mm. in designs for apps or websites or other digital products that graphic students tend mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And I know, um, just to kind of add to this, when we did the trial run of this task, um, I was kind of that user that was completely drawn in by the branding. So immediately when we opened the EE website and it was like this lovely bright yellow, it was like a ray of sunshine to me compared to the Vodafone website. And I, although I understand there's a lot more information there, I feel a lot more comfortable using the EE website and I would not want to buy from Vodafone just because it is too aggressive for me mm. just in like the shape of the kind of boxes that you have to click is so angular and aggressive whereas e is all rounded and lovely and makes me feel a lot more comfortable and here's a perfect example you know we've listened to four people with uh, different opinions and they're all very valid opinions at the end of the day it comes down to the user and what i mentioned earlier about being able to please well, aiming to please most of the people most of the time. Yeah, and I think a mobile phone company has a real challenge because, um, you know, you've got customer bases as young as sort of 15, 16, right up to, you know, people who are retired um, uh, and, you know, all demographics in between. It's very, very difficult um, to, to get the branding right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can um, be very hard. So I think... We were going to move on to a second task, but I think we've kind of got to the end of our allotted time, really. So, Martin, I don't know if you have any kind of conclusion you'd like to add on to the end, or if anybody has any particular questions that they'd like to put to either Jason or Martin, please do put them in the group chat to us, and we can have a little bit of a Q&A, um, particularly if that's more valuable to you rather than going through another exercise. Yeah, okay. I, I, I've lost track of time. I think um, I think the second exercise, yeah, if, if, in terms of what it was, it's a repeat of the first, but it was a different product. Um, just to let everybody know, we were going to we were going to ask people to find a classic style armchair um, in blue um, across three different websites. Um, 
So, and, and again, we would have seen branding coming into play because there's a big, what, you, the three sites with John Lewis uh, next who do a home sort of section and also Ikea. Um, and again, in the test, one of the things we did or the rehearsal, one of the things we realized was that Ikea is the only, of, uh, of the three, it's the only one that's a specialist furniture store. So it had a different way of taking you straight through to, um, uh, to, to the product um, and, and branding played a big role because John Lewis definitely sort of does have a let's say a traditional audience and IKEA probably is the polar opposite of that much more democratic um, but I think I think my, my sort of points really are, are around the the really strong relationship between usability and functionality of digital products and branding and color and feel and typography um, as we've seen, we don't need to do the second exercise to see that, but we've seen it really well in this um, test around trying to find a SIM card. Okay, so Ruby asks, how would you like your portfolio to look for making an application to this course? What kind of artwork would you uh, would help you see the potential for a student to suit on the course? That's a really, really great question, and, and thanks for that. Um, we're, we're certainly not expecting the same type of portfolio that we would normally expect a graphic student to have. Um, the sort of portfolios that we're used to seeing already maybe have a little bit of um, uh, interface design, something that we, you know, UI, we sometimes call that user interface. Um, maybe you've played around with a little bit of basic website design. Um, I think we're really looking for a, 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 just, just um, the sign that you're interested in and aware of um, you know sort of digital products and the design of those um, so uh, it might be that you're doing some sort of computer course um, and you've got some sort of visual output of that some of our applicants have come a little bit more from multimedia courses um, you don't need to come particularly with prior software skills or knowledge but um, as I said at the beginning we, we think of it as a creative exercise in the sense that it is about um, problem solving and it's about analysis. So something that you could put in your portfolio might be, and this is a really, really, really simple thing to do. Um, you could look at, and we do this on the course, you could look at some existing websites. You might take an e-commerce site like the ones we looked at this morning or you, um, you know, other sorts of websites and you could do a written analysis of them. Yeah. You could just write as you feel, um, almost like a stream of consciousness. Take, you know, go through the website, try and perform a number of things. Um, and, and, and analyze what it is that you're feeling and experiencing. So those sorts of things are all very useful. Um, if you've played a little bit with, with some website design, even if you're using an existing template, um, that can also be really useful. So it, it, we wouldn't expect lots and lots of kind of creative drawing and mark making and all the sorts of things that you often get on a more broad arts-based or design course. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Uh, Ruby, I um, just put a link in the chat to the portfolio that I apply to NUA with. Um, it's not representative of the sorts of websites I make today, but um, this is the actual portfolio that I sent to NUA and they talked about in my interview. I came from a uh, computer science and mm -hmm. graphic communication background at A-level, also did geography. And back when I applied to NUA, you did have to do a critical written review of a, a website to get onto this course. I think it's different now. Mm. Um, so you can see my review of Ling's Cars up there, which is a very controversial website when it comes to design. Um, so have a look at that. And for my, my current portfolio is just pendragon.online, which is more of a, an industry spec portfolio that shows um, UX case studies and the work that I've done throughout university. Thanks, Jason. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. Um, so please do um, put any more questions that you have in the chat. Um, but I think we're kind of out of time for this morning's session. But as I said, we have recorded this. So if you'd like to look at it afterwards and also to carry out that second exercise, perhaps with your own students, that's something we would definitely encourage you to do. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback on that. And you can always get in touch with us on Instagram at NUA Outreach or by email, which is student.recruitment at nua.ac.uk. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. We have got a couple more sessions left this week in the series so tomorrow we've got Alex Hill who is course leader um, for our FCP and FNB courses and she'll be giving you an overview of what the fashion industry might look like post-COVID and then also on Wednesday 
um, we have got an introduction to our acting course. We've also um, kind of a talk through the audition process at NUA. So if you or any of your colleagues that might be teaching drama, for example, might be interested in that, please do point them in the direction of our website to book onto that session. Um, but thank you again for joining us and hopefully I'll see you a bit later in the week. Thanks Liv and Jason, thank you so much um, and everyone who's joined in. Um, I, I, I just realised I forgot to um, put at the end of the, the presentation my website, uh, sorry, my email address. Um, but if anyone you know, does want to get in touch because they've got questions that occur to them after today, just get in touch with the university and that, that question can be forwarded to me and I'd be very, very happy to answer anyone's, uh, anyone's question about the course or the application process or, or anything, okay? So, um, but thanks for joining. It's been, it's been really lovely to uh, sort of meet you all this morning. Great. Thanks everybody. Hopefully that was informative. Thanks yeah. guys. See you soon. Bye. Yeah.